Okay, so hi, welcome back. Uh, very excited today to have with me Livio, I think is from Italy. I could be yeah. wrong there. Yeah, right there. And uh, he's an interesting chap who's been following me for a while and we've dialogued a bit back and forth. He has a very exciting Substack channel as well with lots of great personal development tips in it, which I, I often delve into and find some great stuff. And he wanted to also ask me a bit about my new book on Reiki and Breathwork. So we just thought, hey, let's do a let's do a podcast. Let's do a YouTube podcast about it. Um, Livio, maybe you'd like to start by just uh, introducing yourself properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Devaraj. Uh, well, as you said, I'm from Italy, based in Berlin. Um, we've been following each other a while, recommending each other's Substack, and we're interested in similar topics and practice around the same, you know, topics of uh, body works, etc. And specifically, well, what you know, your your audience clearly know know what you write about. While I write a bit more about my my personal journey of reconnection with my emotion, I've been detached for very long. Now I found like my way out also through bodywork practices. And, uh, and not only I know my blog, I share my principles uh, to that are helping me that are guiding this path. Um, and uh, well, recently I was commenting on your last post about your book and we said, okay, no, let, let, let's, let, let's have a conversation about it. <laughs> cool. So, I mean, yeah. Okay. Let, 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 let's go for it. If you've got any questions, just, uh, Ask away. I like to be in the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Well, I would start from the very basics, which is like, if you can help us understand what is uh, Reiki and breath works. Well, to me, Reiki and breath work. I mean, it's really like like when I look back at the different types of breath work I learned when I was doing therapist training. You know, I trained in group therapy in Holland for many years, and. And also other stuff I was doing, there was like there was like rebirthing, there was holotropic breath work, there were various kind of shamanic breath work techniques around. And then a few years ago, I started to come across Reiki and breath work, partly from Jack Willis's uh, book, the Reich Home Book, and also just from other contacts I had in the scene. And as I started to delve into this into this area and also develop my own insights, I realised that it was quite, you know, it was like way more sophisticated. Than, than any of the other breathwork stuff I'd been doing. You know, the, the rebirthing, which I was already leading rebirthing quite regularly. And, and that was a good session to, to, to lead for people and to run for people. And I'd also done holotropic breathwork a few times and been to all sorts of shamanic breathwork classes. Mm -hmm. And they kind of were a bit sort of mystical, but in a sense, they're a bit of a blunt instrument in that what you're mostly doing is you're charging the body with energy by altering the way that you breathe, usually either by breathing more, like physically pulling more air in and pushing more air out, or breathing more quickly, or in a kind of shamanic technique like the breath of fire or whatever. And you do this for a while, it increases the kind of amount of free energy in your body, which is not like scientific energy, but it's like felt, you know, it's how you, you feel yourself in a higher energetic state and then that has a couple of effects which are like one is it brings your stuff closer to the surface but energetic blocks come closer to the surface and the other is God, I was, I've, forgotten, I've forgotten what the other is now um <laughs> but anyway but, but i mean that's the core really but by pumping your body with energy you kind of bring stuff close to the surface, and you also enter the second thing is you also enter a little bit of a different state of consciousness so it takes some of the grip of your mind on your reality out and something can come out. So those are the breathwork techniques I'd encountered before. And, you know, they, they, they tend to get created a bit mystical, too mystical if you ask me, and people go on all sorts of, you know, shamanic mystical trips and spiritual trips and it's okay, you know, but also you can say it's just a way of charging the body with energy. But when I started to come across the Reiki and stuff, which had, which had emerged like really like 30, 40, 50 years before any of this stuff, you know, rebirthing comes from around 1970, Leonard Oil in America. Wright was working these things with these things in the 20s and 30s, before, so mm -hmm. like 50 years before. And it was much more sophisticated. There was an element of charging the body in it, but that was by no means the only kind of thing that was going on with it. You learned literally, you know, 10, 15 different types of breath technique, ways of physically breathing in, breathing out, using different muscle groups, 
And then there were whole sequences of stuff working with different wings of armor, which was a Reikian concept, yes. you know. So what, what, what I came to see was like, you know, whoa, there's all this Reikian stuff. And as I go into a little in the book, none of that really came down through the, you know, when, when Leonard Orr, who started rebirthing, and then Stan Groff, who started holotropic breath work, they were quite big in the kind of alternative scene, which came up from the hippie era, 60s, 70s, Jimi Hendrix, San Francisco, you know, all of this stuff. These guys came from that scene, but the Reikian stream, which was from earlier, didn't, you know, those guys weren't really hippies, you know, that to, to, to study with Reich, you had to be a doctor, you know, a proper MD, GP doctor. And, and you know, Reich also fell into disrepute in the late 40s and 50s, men died in prison in 57. So this whole stream of work that Reich had created and that had been developed, you know, it, it never really, it, it never integrated into the modern, into the modern world. It never integrated into the alternative society, really. And it was only a few practitioners here and there, most of whom were quite, you know, regular psychiatrists and stuff like that who were using these things. And with Reich becoming marginalized in psychology as well from the 50s and 60s onwards, you know, by the time that Jack Willis wrote his book, which was shrouded in a little bit of controversy and blah, blah. But, you know, the whole thing had pretty much died out, you know. And so I thought it was important just to just, just to, to, to write it all down, all the stuff I knew, all the insights and understandings that I'd had from, from being in this field and, and bring something out because it, it is rather as though there's this amazing kind of technology that was going along a hundred years ago and which got replaced by some very simple kind of little engine which just pumps into you. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with rebirthing or holotropic breath work. You know, it's, it's, it's a blunt instrument and a lot of people need a blunt instrument, especially to start with. But th this Reikian thing was like way more sophisticated. It was just way more developed. Mm. So that, that was really, you know, what, what got me in, in, engaged with it and just like, whoa, opening this kind of doorway up and like, Jesus, this thing is like amazing. You know, it's got all this stuff in it, you know, and it's like, it's almost unheard of in some ways. Yeah, nice. So thanks for the overview, first of all. If I'm understanding correctly, you're saying there are a bunch of tools that come from like the 60s that are more like these tools, like open-ended tools. You know, you use them and it's kind of go, you're not sure where you're going to get, while these other, uh, right here breakfast is more like um, a more scientific and coming from 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 medicine or from therapy that actually allows more um as a more variety of techniques and also allows more focused work um how, how, how does that sound yeah basically that's correct i mean i wouldn't say you know reich as a scientist or even as a psychologist in the end fell into quite some disrepute and so i wouldn't say that what he was doing was necessarily any more scientific mm. than what Leonard Orr or Stan Groff were doing, mm. but it was certainly much more sophisticated, and much more developed. You know, you, you, the other breathwork techniques are like just a simple stone tool, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. I, I mean that, I'm not, you know, I'm not being sarcastic or something. There's really nothing wrong with that. It's very useful to, ha to have things like uh, holotropic breathwork and rebirthing, but you know, the, the level of sophistication is minimal. You're doing roughly the same thing most of the time. Whereas the Reikian technique, you've got all these different breathwork techniques and you've got all these different armor release techniques which you can put together. So you've literally got like a hundred tools against one or two, you know, that's how it how it kind of goes. Yeah, it, it, since you're mentioning, I'm mean, curious, no, there's, there's this framework of the seven um, like rings of armor, right? And, yeah. uh, and you're saying that can you can you elaborate a bit on how then the practice works so that you can actually i guess work on on these rings or yeah yes i mean reich had this hypothesis that that the human body on a kind of energetic level was more like an earthworm you know which isn't a very kind of uh exciting comparison for us but you know an earthworm moves it's got these kind of segments that go around its body and then it has to it moves one segment and then the other kind of follows along and then the next one follows along. And if mm -hmm. there's any, if any of the segments are too tense or if there's, especially if there's unhealthy linkage between two segments, the earthworm cannot move, it can't move. 
And so Reich used this as an analogy for the human, that there were segments of armor, he said, around the eyes, around the mouth, around the throat, chest, diaphragm, belly, abdominals, and pelvis and legs. And these seven rings, you know, the, the tendency was that they could get tense, or more importantly, there could be unhealthy coupling between the rings. So the people's whole kind of face or head would become rigid. These rings of ring, these 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 rings around the segments, as he called them, would become locked together. You know, and you can see that in a lot of people that their heads and faces are quite rigid. You know, and then so he said, well, you have to work. You have to break. You have to break this tension up. This unhealthy binding between the rings. And the basic way that you do it, I mean, there's a slight variety of ways, but often it's it's finding certain muscle groups within that ring and then either keeping them super tense, or sometimes they can be tensed in two different directions, like eyes wide open and eyes tight closed, you know, and at the same time doing certain breath techniques. And so, and done over time, this, this causes, you know, the, the unhealthy tension between these, between, say, the mm. ocular and the mouth ring to break up so that your mouth can kind of move independently of your eyes and your, you know, your throat can move independently of your, your mouth. You know, this, this unhealthy linkage starts to break up and this makes you happier. And because Wright's basic concept was like, there's a flow of energy through the body and this flow gets broken up, gets, gets repressed, held down and bound up by our kind of ego motivated personality, trying to keep us under control. You know, and then that after a time becomes armored into our body, you know, and we no longer really experience energy. We no longer really experience being alive. We're in a kind of mechanical, somewhat robot like state, you know. So his whole thing was, I'm going to break that up and get get the natural flow of energy in people moving again. Yeah. And the worm can move again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The worm can move again. It can go forward. So we can go backwards, I guess, if worms go backwards. <laughs> And it got me curious about this because I, I guess for my personal experience, also to, um, also bioenergetics work on similar blockages, right? So I'm curious to understand then in, in practice, how, for instance, the two differ. I know they're very broad you know, disciplines, but just to understand um, what is different about them. Mm. Well, bioenergetics was created by a student of Reich called Alexander Lowen, Dr. Lowen, and it's more than standing up. Uh, it, it's not, I don't think Lowen, I mean, I'm sure he was familiar with Reich's concept of segmental armoring, which is the proper name for what we've just been discussing, but he doesn't seem to work so directly with that. Mm. His, his work is more, yeah, put your body in positions, breathe and feel, and it's more stand up. What I have personally noticed from doing a lot of Reiki and breath work and a lot of bioenergetics is that the lying down practices, when you start to get them, you know, that they're a little more advanced in a sense that it's quite good to do bioenergetics before you do Reiki and breath work. Actually, even in a session, you know, like with the 12 weeks of content that I put in this book, you know, for most of the weeks, I say do the bow and arch, which are kind of foundational postures from bioenergetics first. Do those to open your body for 10 minutes, whatever. And then you start doing the Reiki and breath work. The breath work is more subtle and you it, it's more based on feeling. You know, when your body's up and you're doing your postures or you're doing dynamic postures, you're kind of it's a little more of a blunt instrument to open things up. And it, it's yeah. good. But I've certainly noticed that the, the benefit, once you start to get belly breathing and Reiki and breathing, which is two slightly different techniques going, when you start to use these armoring techniques, you know, they're more appropriate to be done lying down because you're there's a limit to what you can do standing up because naturally you will fall over if you do anything too extreme. So, you know, your, your brain is not going to let you do anything really stupid so that you fall over. But when you're lying down on the floor in this position with your knees up, you know, you can, you, you can, in a sense, break up a lot more stuff. So I find the two kind of concepts, you know, the bio, bioenergetics, and the writing breath are quite complementary to each other, you know, for working, working with rings, working with tension, just improving, improving our, our, our psychology, basically. Mm. And so, so, and this complementarity exists, I understand, in time, meaning 
maybe a client, a person at the beginning starts with bioenergetics and then over time can 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 not go into breath words, or they can exist also within a session. Um, you partially touched on it, but I'm curious, what, what are the benefits that within a single session then Reiki and breath words can bring to the initial work that is done more standing or like with via via, via bioenergetics works? I mean, generally how I do it, because people ask me this, because I've got online courses on each subject, you know, yeah. and some people who really want to just charge in and get going, you know, they will sign up to both courses and do them back to back. And sometimes that works. Sometimes they have to drop one for a while because it's just bringing, stirring too much stuff up and, and then come back to it later. Sometimes people have got mobility issues, you know, major health issues, and then the Reiki and breath work is more appropriate because it's done lying down. But... For your question, you know, it's like when you start with a Reiki and breath work, I mean, you're really learning a whole load of tools and you're starting to break up some rings. I think you just notice that you're more inside yourself for many people. It's very, you can't, you see, it depends. It's tricky because it depends what someone is carrying around. And, and also, you know, you can, you can look at their character structure that can give you some leads as to which technique bio or Reiki might be better. But it's very hard to know. We, we exist in this kind of weird world as human beings where, you know, we have certain ideas about who we are, you know, what's wrong with us and blah, 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 but we don't have any actual information. We just have ideas about it. And at the same time, we have ideas about who we should be in order to get our needs met or be successful. So this is just a mess, really, you know, and then it's like, and then from there, you know, so you can't really tell from the outside exactly what the effect of one of these things will have on any specific person. I can have an idea from looking at their their body movement or, or their character structure or something like that. Most of these techniques are things you have to try and see if they work for you, basically. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah. And there's something that is... Uh... Yeah, you touched already upon one of the questions I had. Um, I was actually reading the introduction of the book and, and you, you got the first part. You mentioned this challenge of becoming natural again. Mm. Uh, I, could you elaborate on that and, and explain how this links with, with all the things we, we have been saying? Yeah, because like, you know, I think for a lot of people, when you start therapy, you know, when I started therapy, it's more like, I don't know. I didn't want to be so fucked up. I wanted to be able to get a girlfriend. I had certain, and it was like, I, I, I'm trying to create, I'm trying to cobble together a new personality, you know? And if someone would have said to me, just be natural, that would be like, that. Well, what do you mean just be natural? What does that look like? My mind is like, oh, what does that look like? You know, how can I model naturalness? You know, so this, <laughs> in a sense, is really useful because it can show you that, that the lunacy of, of, of our minds at time, you know, that you cannot model your natural self because you don't know what it is. But what you can do is you can, you can, you can recognize and take out blocks. You can take out blocks because, so this is like a core concept in, in all of these body-based therapy kind of, you know, therapy techniques is that there are blocks. And if you take out the blocks or take out a block, what remains, the person you are afterwards, is more natural than the person you were before. And, and, and you will, when you approach naturalness, it's like you don't, you know, you don't get thrown around so much by the world around you. You know, things can still be very intense, but it's like if you know you're being natural, then someone might be pissed off with you or something like that. But it, it's like you are just being yourself. You know, it's like this is that there's a kind of self-acceptance which comes over time where you, you give up this game of trying to be someone, you know, it's mm. like, you know, it's something like that, really. But it is interesting to see people trying to model naturalness. I lived for a long time in a spiritual community and there people try to model being spiritual, you know, and it's just a fucking joke, basically, you know, it's like, it's just madness, you know, but that's what, that's what we get up to as human beings, you know, we try to model, we try to make it look like we are a certain kind of person. And th this, this game is going on all the time. And then, 
at some point we may get an inkling or something may happen or a crisis. For me, it was crises, you know, it's, and then it's like, just, I just need to stop this stupid game. It's not working, you know, and I need to find out more who I am. You know, we go, we come out of this kind of horizontal access of acquisition of trying to get stuff, trying to look a certain way mm -hmm. and into a more mm -hmm. vertical access, a vertical axis of like, who am I? You know, who am I? Where, where's my inner journey? You know? Yeah. It, it reminds me a bit what you said is, um, is like, you know, you cannot decide to surrender, right? You you get there. You know, it's like, it cannot be a decision when you said no. It, I mean, I want to be spiritual. You know, often often uh, is related to these type of topics. Uh, actually, uh, it, there there is a question I have about this because you know, uh, some time ago I've been doing like, for instance, um, TRE uh, trainings as, as you know trauma release exercise trainings as a um, teacher, and I've never understood if this naturalness let's say that we as you're defining it is a state where we are all the same as if like we go back to being a child and all child are born equal or is just being who uh, authentically i am which is going to be different than who authentically you are um i don't know if you get my question yeah yeah i'd say it's for sec the second you know I mean, what, what, what I see with a lot of people, particularly in the West, they have an intrinsic desire to go back to the child state. <laughs> Probably, I guess, being a therapist, something to do with the fact that they just didn't get much fun in childhood. You know, they, they had to take responsibility, or they had trauma, and then, and then you had to get a job and get a wife or husband or whatever, you know, and do all your kind of stuff. And somewhere inside, there's this little child that never really got to play and have fun and just wants to go back to that just wants to go back to that it's it's quite common with westerners i think that, that mm. they see that you know but naturalness is something that you can only discover for yourself you know your mind will always want a shortcut that's what it's kind of been programmed by evolution to do it'll look for shortcuts look for models look to get somewhere without having to really face yourself that's what it will do you know it's like that's what it but that, that's its kind of programming, you know. It's not doing anything wrong. It's just that's just how it's been made, you know. So it's running its little programs, and you know, if you're lucky, some massive crisis comes, and that sends you deep into yourself. You know, you can't avoid it. You know, and with guidance, then you can then you can go deeper from that. Or otherwise, people sometimes are successful in life, and they just kind of get the stuff that society's been telling them to get, and then it's like, now what? You know, it's like now what? You know. Yeah. yeah yeah i can relate to that and if you're lucky we get to that earlier rather than later yeah. yeah yeah i mean that's the great madness of the society really in a way and it's not really madness you know there's an underlying there's things it achieves as well but you know people will so many people work all their lives just to have a decent amount of money and if they ever had a decent amount of money they'd realize it probably wasn't what they were looking for you know I've had, you know, a decent amount of money, not millions and millions, but I've had a decent amount of money. And then you realize it's not really what you're looking for. But if you never get to that point where you have a decent amount of money, you never really get, it's still like a carrot in front of a donkey, you know, and you're still working away and doing your thing to try and get your money and, and to try and get like this, you know, and the same, all these things apply, you know, all, all these kind of games apply. Many guys will chase, they feel a bit low self-esteem. So they think if I had a really pretty girlfriend that everyone fancies, then, you know, then I would be okay. And then if they never get, <clears throat> sorry, if they never get the really pretty girlfriend, then they just go on fantasizing about it. But if they get the really pretty girlfriend, they, they, they realize that it's not, it's not transforming your life. This is just the way society works. Whether, however, you know, we, we have this idea, but we just, if we could just get something from the outside, then we would be okay, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I guess the wish is like, I mean, my personal experience is that if you're lucky enough, you get this as, as quickly as possible so that you realize that the thing was not the thing, yes. you know? Like, yes. Actually, <laughs> the direction of the side should have been pointed in, inwards. <laughs> rather yeah. Than, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you get the thing that you've been waiting for for so long, you know? And, and then it's like, hmm, what now? You know, people will say this all the time. You know, you work with successful people. Yeah, I, I, now I got my yacht. I got my model girlfriend. I got my this, that, or the other. And, and now what? 
and now what? You know, it's like on some deeper level, they thought maybe their dad would come suddenly come out of the grave and give them love or something, you know, or whatever it is on a very deep, because they haven't investigated internally, they've just been chasing on the outside. You know, it's like it, these phantoms of our past are, are, are sitting there driving us forwards, but it's not, it's not really healthy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks for sharing that. Uh, I, I'm wondering, getting back to, to Reiki and Breathworks and, you know, your book, um, so we talked about like, you know, what it is, the difference between other breathwork techniques and then difference with bioenergetics, possible complementarities. I'm wondering how, um, how can someone get started? And and here I mean, is is a practice that can be done autonomously or only in therapy? Um, can the two things be combined? I'm curious about this. Well, you know, my basic practice in this field is, is 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 breathing with the belly, practicing using abdominal breathing, which has been a huge journey for me over the last couple of years. And I mean, it's not even one of the real core techniques of Reich, but in the book, I I I made it a core technique because I see it's so valuable, and also because Western medicine is kind of coming to it now. It's it's people get taught it or a version of it for like chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, you know, lung blockages and stuff like this. But that's a really core technique to actually learn how to breathe by using by moving your abdominals and not your throat muscles. You know, it's like it's it, it's really a meditation, but and, and it takes quite a while. I mean, it's something I think that the average person would have to practice for a number of years, maybe. But when when you get that, it's like you you can instantly or almost instantly get your nervous system to just go down, to just go down. You can in fact, you can get in super stressful situations and then literally bring your nervous system right down by using this technique, because that, that, that's basically what, what when, the, when we start to breathe by only using the abdominals and particularly the lower abdominals, that, that, that will take the nervous system right out of fight or flight straight away. But like I say, because we've developed so many bad habits with breathing, it's, it, it's not a straightforward thing to do. But... It's something you can practice, and, and and when you get it, you know it'll it's 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 it is revelationary. It's life changing. Just as a simple technique, it's absolutely worth it. And you can do it lying down or sitting down, comfy, you know. But you just breathe and feel your body, and you you try to just move your abdomen, push your abdomen abdominals out, and try not to use any of your throat muscles. And don't worry about whether no air is coming in through your nose or your mouth. It makes no difference in mm. this mm. kind of thing. Mm. That's a very powerful technique. It's, it's similar in a way that, you know, the Buddha, like two and a half thousand years ago, when he first brought out the Pasana, one of the standard ways of learning it was follow the movements of your belly as you breathe. Because people in those days probably did breathe more with the belly. You know, mm. nowadays it's more. It's more with that, that we're using all these muscles around the throat, you know, and sternum play the mastoid and that kind of thing. Mm. So that's like a, a, t a very simple technique that anyone can practice. And it's very, very tough to master. And But when you do get it, you know, it's like literally, it's like instant meditation. Is there a, is there any pattern to follow and to be quick or, or slow or like, what do you recommend? Well, this belly breathing, I mean, probably the breathing cycle, it shouldn't be too quick. It should be between about five and 10 seconds for inhale and exhale, something mm -hmm. like that, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it, it literally is learning to breathe by moving your abdominals only. And it, it is challenging because part of our mind's kind of control trip with, it, it kind of sucks and blows air almost out using the muscles in the throat, you know, and the the pecs and, and this kind of thing and, and the intercostals, which are good muscles, so to speak, you know, but part of our mind's control trip is it doesn't really trust our lower body to function. It doesn't really trust it. It's like a boss. If you've ever been to a company where the boss is always looking over your shoulder, you know, like you're trying to do your work and it's kind of, he or she is looking over your shoulder to see if you got it right. They're like over managing, you know, over managing, not trusting the team. And a part of the brain does not trust the belly to breathe, does not trust it. So what happens is you start to learn belly breathing, you'll go through phases when you realize that you're in acute fear, just to even continue. You have to feel it and, and, and keep on going. 
you know, just feel it in your body and just continue practicing and slowly, slowly, little by little, the brain will let go of control and, and it will allow you to just breathe with your belly. Okay. It's as if the mind wants to keep everything closer to itself so it yes. can manage it while not letting it go. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good metaphor. I've not, I've n never thought of that before. Exactly. Mm. It is, it's like this very controlling mama, you know? Like you <laughs> Italian society. Manja mama, you know. I mean, <laughs> I mean, personally, I can see it on on myself after many years of um, like work on myself. Recently, I can really see how I can really relate to this. So I can see like how how I've been holding together, holding up all my organs. I would say, but specifically the stomach. And now, as I get in relaxed states, either through breath works or other techniques. I can feel there is almost a fear that my belly will, would fall on the floor. It's like that won't be able to sustain itself. Mm -hmm. and possibly it's similar to, to what you're describing in terms of this fear. Or, I've mm -hmm. never saw it. Yeah, under yeah, yeah, no, it sounds, it, 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 I think it is, you know, and, and it's a journey, you know. My, my mind is still, you know, in, in shock and fear, part of it, you know. You know, I work on it and move and move, but I mean, it's still it's still there. This control trip, but it's kind of exerted across the upper part of my body. Mm, 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 mm. Okay, so this can be a start uh, for a for an individual practice. Uh, that's you know, I guess you're suggesting that people may do it. I don't know, maybe in the morning and and do that. Um, I'm wondering, you know, if you then, as a as a as a therapist, as a practitioner, uh, you want then to bring this into your practice. Um, how would that differ? Uh, how, how, I know it's very painful. I don't. I don't quite follow. Sorry. Yeah. So this is the start. Like starting to breathe in this way is the start for me as an individual. Uh, to to work on this if i if i go to a practitioner as a client what what can i instead exp expect expect to come out out of um um out of the therapy i mean obviously i know that is a very broad field but i can i can make an example of bioenergetics if i had to say what from bioenergetics you get an increased sense of the body, you know, lack of um, removal of rigidity, more aliveness. I'm wondering what, what could be, you know, the benefits of doing a right, right hand therapy for a certain amount of time. Yeah, yeah, no, I get you. I mean, for me, you know, the, the, there's kind of a core task in, in any kind of body based therapy, which is to recenter energy around the belly. Most people have kind of they, they can't feel their belly, you know, they, they, they can't feel the, their abdominal muscles very much. They can't feel this area of the body. And yet for me, you know, this is kind of your primate center. It's where everything connects up. In the West, you know, nowadays a lot of people want to feel the heart, you know, which is great, you know, but if you can't first feel your belly, if you start to feel your heart, you'll probably stay up here. You probably won't go down there because it's like, oh, I'm gonna to have to dig through the shit. No, I want my nice little heart feeling. It's not very deep, but I've got a bit and, and I can take my risks and I don't want to dig through the shit, you know? So with any kind of therapy, for me, that, that's just, I mean, a client might come with a specific intention, something they want to do, get over low self-esteem, just have more energy, not be so anxious, wh whatever, you know? Or they may come because they're into character structure and they're, they're stuck in the oral or the endure or whatever, you know, but... But the, the core for me is, is is nevertheless, you know, so they might, you know, I might be creating something specific for them, you know, to fulfill their need. But otherwise, the core for me is to get more energy down low into the belly so that the person's whole lower body can reconnect, you know, and they can start to feel like they've got energy, you know, that they've got, they've got will, you know, they've got agency. And then from there, you know, you can do some heart-centered work as well, you know, particularly for someone's overly aggressive or they can't really feel you know but yeah. this is you no know, to me this is like you know this is a life journey you know it's a life journey and you know that can seem like a long time which it is but at the same time it's like you know when i look at my journey 
I got stuff which I wanted, you know, and then I just kept going. You know, when I first started therapy, I didn't have a girlfriend. I wanted a girlfriend, but I'm too fucked up to get a girlfriend. Women can see him. They're keeping their distance. Did a year's therapy, got a girlfriend. And then at some point it was like, I want to keep doing therapy, you know, and uh, there were some dramas and stuff, but like with the girlfriend, but like, it, it was like, you know, I, I got started on something for one reason. And then I just got interested in it and kept going, really. That's basically, that's, that's, that's my reality. And there's always something that pulls me in a bit deeper for me. You know, it just keeps on, it doesn't really stop. You know, there's still a desire for challenge, self-challenge, a desire to go deeper, you know. And so I don't know where that quite comes from, but I, I, I do have that. I mean, it doesn't totally motivate me. I can be pretty damn lazy as well. But, you know, it's definitely there as well in the background. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, never, there's not, there is no end, right? <laughs> no, there's no, there, there, there's no end, you know, there's, I think the main thing for some, for a human being, reality, you know, any human who's interested in this vertical access, who am I, basically, as opposed to what can I get, you know, any human, there's nothing wrong with what can I get, it's good if it leads also to who am I, you know, with any human like that, there's like a, you need to get through a doorway, you know, and once you've got through the doorway, then you're in a different kind of state, and then you see what's on offer. But for many people, and in a sense, particularly the, these days, even though people are softer, it's like they're so locked off from this doorway, this internal doorway, they can't get through it. And on a deep level, I would maintain every human being wants to get through, back through the inner doorway, you know, so that you start to feel more deeply, you know, you start to open up internally. You can't get there by thinking it's not going to work. It's not going to work. It will promise and it will take your money and it will give you this, that and the other, but it won't get you through the inner doorway. It, and, and and in a sense, that's what, that is what everyone on some level is looking for, to get back in through that inner doorway. And once you open that up, you know, and sometimes it opens up, for me, it was with a massive burst of crying once, you know, in a workshop, you know, for like an hour, you know, and for other people, it's different things, but you need to break through something. For most people, they will need to break through something to get sufficiently inside to recognize that what they've been chasing after probably isn't, you know, it's been kind of mechanical in life. And they start to get interested in this who am I kind of axis, you know, and for sure it can be cool to make money and have lots of lovers and all of these things or whatever. And, but, but also that the inner journey becomes more attractive and more interesting to them. You know, it's not that you totally stop any acquisitional behavior, but that, that's kind of a core that on some level, I think everyone is searching. They want to get inside, but usually there's quite a hardened layer they have to get through to, to, to get that experience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Like I, I took some notes as we were talking and I, I think probably the concept that uh, attracted my attention the most is what you mentioned a couple of minutes before, like this goal of recentering around the belly, let's say, like around the physical center of the body, mm. which then is like related to this inner doorway and like getting closer to the inner or, or inner doorway and, you know, go deeper in ourselves. Mm. And to some extent, these practices lead you there and lead you there through experience rather than through thinking, mm. which might rather be another way not, not to do it instead. Mm. Uh, so thanks, thanks for that. Um, I think I am I have a much clearer ideas of uh, what the uh, Reiki and breathworks is, and uh, yeah, I, I think I think you replied most of the question I had. Cool. Well, thank you, Livio. It was one of these spontaneous kind of things to do. It's 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 sweet to meet 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 you in person, and uh, thank you for coming up with these questions. So. I really appreciate you for doing that, man. I, I mean that. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you.